series of, of, of webinars um, where we are welcoming uh, Professor Axel Polaris. He heads the Institute of Information Business at the uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business, where he's been since 2013 um, as a full professor in data and knowledge engineering. Um, Axel um, has uh, worked in academia in many places in, in Europe and, and, and in the US that are known for their contributions to the open data uh, field. Um, and since 2013 is, is now uh, leading the group in Vienna at the, at the Economics and Business University, where he's led several projects you might have heard of um, that are making a difference in the open data ecosystem around common concerns uh, like the quality of open data, um, the um, availability and impact of open data portals, um, as well as open data archi archiving as a means to um, be able to use open data sets across different versions uh, more sustainably. Um, so I'm very happy that Axel agreed to, to talk to us today um, about their journey in learning how we move from um, individual open data portals to um, open data ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for the very kind introduction and welcome everybody. And um, thanks again for the invitation to be able to speak in this webinar series. Uh, on open data portals, uh, which is very exciting for me here, uh, particularly as an academic researcher here to talk to um, uh, this webinar series organized by the European Open Data Portal, um, which I hope the invitation at least even shows already that we might have uh, managed to make a bit of an impact here also to our research. And um, as Elena mentioned, we uh, work in our group which in our institute, which actually has now recently, just a few weeks ago, been renamed from Institute for Information Business uh, to Institute for Data Process and Knowledge Management, as you see here on the title slide. Um, we work on, on various topics on, on data management and data ecosystems. Um, you find more information about what we do in our group, um, for instance, on, on my webpage, which you have linked there, um, but also, um, you will find actually the, the slides there if you're interested um, that in, in the presentation section of that homepage. Um, but I should say that my background is maybe rather, um, even as the title suggests, from open data portals to open data ecosystems, my background is rather um, going the other way around, um, I would say, from, and I would maybe try to call it from open data ecosystems to open data. So let me tell you what I mean with this. Um, uh, the past like 15 years, um, my work uh, research, research in my group or in the groups I've worked in, um, was mainly revolving about the idea of the semantic web and linked open data, uh, which is also open data, but it's uh, maybe a fraction of open data as we talk about it here in, in the context of open data portals. Um, so we mainly worked uh, on standards, uh, like RDF and query languages uh, like Sparkle um, for the idea or the vision to make data machine readable, uh, available and linked on the web in a decentralized manner. That means that actually any data provider could um, link pieces and bits of data that are interconnected on the web. So using the web as an infrastructure, as an ecosystem, for data publishing and data processing, as we also develop methods to scale the processing of data um, in these ecosystems um, in the, uh, across data sources that are spread over the web, um, which um, has led to this picture that you've seen here, um, which in many incarnations, anybody who's heard semantic web or linked data has seen a lot of times. I still like to display it as a as now it is a, um, a picture that basically shows what we have built. we've built is a network of distributed, partially connected 
um, knowledge graph. So each of these dots is in, in a sense, a graph of information that is interconnected and that are interconnected with each other. Um, and we have spent a lot of uh, work on analyzing this and, and most recently we have um, uh, published an article um, with the authors that you see here at the bottom of the slide um, on actually analyzing this network and how well it actually re re represents web and what we've achieved as a research community um, here. And the common state of affair of this web of data um, as was conceived in this semantic web community is that basically we have um, good common standards for data and metadata descriptions built with this standard uh, with the language of RDF. Um, we have actually ontologies that are widely reused across these um, nodes and bits and pieces um, that you find here in this, um, in this depiction. Each node of that um, represents such a knowledge graph. And that could be actually um, mean uh, understood in, in your um, uh, nomenclature of open data portals as metadata schemata or standards. Um, for instance, schema.org is available as such as uh, um, RDF vocabulary, but also DCAT that is widely used in open data portals as well. Um, maybe a little, less, little bit less expressive than originally expected, but I, I think our, the community has made a big um, contribution and also impact to standardized metadata vocabulary, which are so important to integrate and find data on the web. Um, we've also developed fairly scalable methods for distributed processing and querying this, uh, this data, um, which is still a very active um, field of research. Um, like if you look at um, decentralized query processing and still progressing a lot in academic research, uh, I myself have some uh, PhD student working on that. Uh, right now, we had some works, um, for instance, in top 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 conferences like that, where this is presented and further um, being developed. Um, um, last but not least, um, this they are not like um, in bigger size there, but I think it's it's important to note that um, this web of data contains some center nodes, I would call them, around which other knowledge um, artifacts and data um, can gather and be crystallized and be linked to. Um, for, for instance, the Wikipedia, um, Wikidata, or um, if you see, look at all these red dots here in these linked data clouds, they are usually um, from the bio um, uh, and life sciences domain where something like BioPortal, a collection of ontologies um, from the bio domain that has been transferred to this linked data format is a very important um, part of the game. Um, what we see, so, uh, but what we also see is, um, despite this research um, for all these years, there are also some downsides. So the downsides I would call um, in this state of affair is, is maybe the lack of instance data links. So basically all these, although we claim that this is linked data, they, it's not as linked as it could be because um, there exist actually not so many references. So 28 of the data sets, 28% in these linked data clouds do not even link to each other or to link to ex external instances of data. So they don't reuse the, um, data from other sources. They are not really connected as well as they could be. There is also a lot of these dots that you see here in the meanwhile have disappeared, mainly because many of those have been academic efforts to transfer some data to these linked data formats um, that just were dying out of with, when the PhD student left the, the, the building. Um, with their doctorate and, and it couldn't be longer maintained, which is a sad but uh, true reality. So it's maybe to some extent um, has been a more academic exercise um, to um, pursue this road of linked data. Um, so it's hard to maintain this for, for academics only. Yeah? Um, but um, another problem is that actually this, da this data is still hard to consume, although we have the, with, with RDF this um, common format for not only metadata but also data artifacts. Um, it's published in different variants of RDF, different subformats like um, JSON-LD, um, RDF XML, etc. And it's it's still hard to consume. So we haven't managed to build at the same time, which is also part of a data ecosystem, um, the easy tools that allow us to consume this out of the box and maybe have some cloud um, style data science uh, pipelines where you can just import and gather the data out of the out of the box. Um, from this decentralized data ecosystem. So um, I would say that basically publishing best practices are still missing to some extent. And we could argue that um, I think in the context of data ecosystems, 
Um, the acronym of FAIR is, is appearing recently um, all across not only research data, but if you haven't, uh, if you don't know what FAIR data publishing means, it's basically um, FAIR is an acronym and there have been some principles designed around it um, about findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable um, data published. And we could argue that linked data and uh, linked open data has achieved this to some extent, um, but maybe not wholly yet. So there's still some work to do. Um, now, during this research that uh, we did over these past years, um, I got also quite excited about open data because this was kind of a meanwhile happening in parallel, lots of open data uh, portals appearing um, and publishing these metadata catalogs and links to actually structured data, not RDF. Um, so it's basically um, the metadata is uniformly accessible via common APIs, mostly JSON rather than RDF, that's fine. And the data sets themselves are in different data formats. But there's lots of it and it actually has um, push and, and support by governments. So this um, was, we were quite exciting about this boom of, of open data taking place. Um, whereas we see um, since then uptake of open data is mostly, at least in the beginning, in the form of like apps and data journalism um, um, and basically data, this data being used um, in the form of single data sets. So it's not so much this idea of that these data sets were um, easily combinable or actually even findable, um, how they were easily uh, to be combined. And that's maybe um, something I want to talk about, um, which um, is something that, in my opinion, is still missing for making open data uh, a, a full data ecosystem. But uh, what I want to get at through all this talk is that basically both these things, um, the, the, the linked data approach and also the open data, um, are parts of a whole data ecosystem as I think we need it. So what was exciting in this history of uh, research when we basically got to open data, we, we saw um, um, open data appearing since um, and really being pushed by politics and we had big hopes as uh, also as researchers um, because there was such a huge political push which we could argue now whether it's still um, it's still, still as big as it used to be but I think at least in the EU um, there is still a big um, push for open data and, and pushing this forward. Um, now we, you know, probably all the timeline that uh, when things more or less started um, with the launch of DataGov, DataGov UK being among the first, and then um, also the EU um, open data strategy, and, and since then basically um, making data open data default in the US for some um, for public data sets, and we thought, okay, that's really exciting because we have essentially all kinds of like demographic data, the data about cities, um, um, statistics being published by all these countries and we can compare them, we can integrate them and we have the tools to do this from our research in Semantic Web and that's why we, we started to jump on this topic. So um, our first attempt, um, that's the first paper mentioned here, um, was basically when I was still working with Siemens, we tried to um, build a data pipeline from open data um, that gather data about cities to make um, comparable assessments, for instance, about their um, sustainability. So we kind of try to emu emulate something like the Green City Index um, uh, that was published by Siemens um, that compared cities uh, among their um, um, sustainability indicators. So the idea was that we could get these sustainability indicators from different open data sources like UN data, um, World Bank open data, but also the open data published by the different cities and could with semantic web technologies integrate them automatically in a in a growing uh, data pool that would allow us to do reassess these sustainabilities because we we were assuming that this data is regularly updated of course by the cities and the provider and then have basically a, an observatory for um for city data um now this read to a, led to a great PhD by one of my students, Stefan. Uh, um, and the answer of whether we could basically use open data as such a web of data needed for answering such questions like the development of cities um, was partially. Yeah? So basically, uh, we, we found ourselves still doing a lot of manual integration of the data sets. We were finding ourselves still doing um, just the integration of a handful of data sources 
rather than basically using the full um, amount of all the open data portals out there and automatically gathering and integrating the data, data from there, uh, which for us as web of data researchers was a bit disappointing, but we made good progress and we collected and integrated data from different sources, maybe only two or three, UN data, um, World Bank data, et cetera, Eurostat. Um, and then we were hoping that actually we could develop like predictions or approximations of missing indicators and develop models that would um, uh, basically learn on how sustainable certain cities are. Um, we also had the assumption that the more data becomes available, which we were expecting over time to happen in open data, the better the data uh, quality um, will become or the, the easier we could fix quality issues by this is machine learning methods that, that basically help us to detect outliers and, and, and assess the quality. And uh, the better this will work. Um, now, what we, for, in, uh, for investigating this, um, we basically wanted to know whether open data is actually developing in these directions. So is actually more data becoming av av available? How is actually the state of the quality in open data? And how hard would it be to integrate more data sources? And how uh, well would this be automated? So um, this was basically the start of a, a second PhD. So this is two uh, folks working in my group back then, Jürgen and uh, Sebastian. Uh, Jürgen as a postdoc and um, Sebastian just joining as a PhD student, who, who were set the task um, in this project to, to monitor open data and the development of its quality. And then basically eventually finding out whether we can automatically collect and integrate this data. So can we make open data fair automatically is kind of the big vision um, uh, that we were pursuing in this research. Um, so we started with um, building up a quality assessment framework of open data portals, where we um, monitored um, the um, uh, data from different open, mainly the metadata from different open data portals. Um, so here in, uh, we, so we have several projects uh, since then, um, which uh, the results of which you find collected on this web page, DataViewLTLT. Um, where we have um, reported some of these projects, for instance, this Open Data Portal Watch project, which I want to talk a bit more about in the next couple of minutes. Um, we also had uh, another project like Adequate, uh, it was called, it was a project together with the Austrian Open Data Portal to actually do quality, uh, data quality measuring and metrics um, for, the, for the Open Data Portal, and then also went into this uh, quality assessment. Um, uh, framework that we did in this portal watch project and, and further projects like this community data project. You can look at them at the links, which all were in the context of open data. But um, let me go um, into a bit more detail into the portal watch project. So here our idea was to collect and assess metadata quality over time. So our idea was to basically gather from all these um, data portals the metadata put in a comparable form and see how well, um, how many, how much data is published, how does it develop over time um, and assess its quality. Like, is there viable, are the links actually non broken? Is the, is the, the metadata complete? Uh, does it contain contact information, et cetera? So we, we um, developed um, crawlers and basically we were um, benefiting from that many of these use um, similar APIs, like uh, there were just a handful of, uh, of, uh, of frameworks out there um, used by uh, open data um, portal providers back then, uh, mostly the Seekan, uh, Socrata and open data soft, which we could integrate in this uh, portal watch where we monitor um, like over 260 over time um, open data portals. Some of them have been are gone in between. We have to also say this. So we see also um, open data portals come and go. Um, and uh, we, we basically weekly or later on by, based by change frequency, try to update and um, and collect the metadata from these portals and, and take snapshots, which we could analyze based on certain data quality dimensions. Like, um, as I said, uh, we were, for instance, trying to compare the licenses of the data being published, um, the contact av data availability, um, availability of the download resources, um, see how the data is actually changing, um, and, and various other um, 
quality dimensions that are described in Sebastian's thesis, um, but also provide some dashboards about the um, development of this data. So what we also see in these um, dashboards or in this uh, development is that um, you see that there's a lot of things going on that can't be really assessed. So you don't really see really a trend here of what's happening um, on the portal sometimes because um, partially um, the crawls were sometimes also in, uh, um, incomplete due to non-availability of the server. Um, some, some data sets were offline. And I'll get to the reasons for that um, in some later slides. So uh, building up such a uh, framework turned out to be harder than we expected and building up the monitoring and, and seeing something from this monitoring. What we actually wanted to learn, like how do the data portals develop, turned out to be harder than we thought. Um, so we could say if we want to have an answer on the question like does actually more metadata become available or more data become available on open data um, portals, is a bit hard to say. So I give you, um, like now I try to analyze our metadata, all the metadata that we collected um, and just state like how many data sets were available over this portal and put that in a visualization for some portals. And you see that the graph looks quite confusing here. So we see that some portals um, had increasing numbers um, according to our references and just dropped. And that might just been because they, the reasons might be subtle because they just switched their interface and we failed the crawls or basically um, we also switched internally our database and maybe our pipeline didn't catch it. Um, and after all, you have to also um, take into consideration we have here one PhD student working with it and we are not a company that basically can uh, maintain a 24 seven crawler um, uh, really entirely perfect. Um, but we also see um, certain portals that we may see, maybe put more effort in, 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 in checking their progress, like here, data GVAT, we have that relatively constant and we see increasing uh, data sets, but it's also not exploding. So we, we didn't see like, um, at least over the last few years, data exploding. By the way, the time axis down there means um, the first two digits is the year, like if you see here 16 in 2060, 16 and 50 means calendar weeks 50. So it's not um, the, the year or anything. It's basically the first two digits are the year and the second two digits are the week of the year because we, uh, as I told you in the beginning, we had weekly calls. So why were these crawls like um, difficult um, for us to do was, it was affected by, by failed cry, uh, crawls. It was um, affected also by wrong metadata. So we had to do a lot of like manual alignment or found out by one call that actually we, uh, our, our metrics conversion didn't catch it. If there was any change in the metadata keys, um, we had some problems sometimes. Uh, this is getting better recently as, as there's more convergence towards DCAT. Um, but um, we had to kind of also manually integrate all the different metadata standards into DCAT um, before there was such mappings for all these data frameworks uh, readily available. Because we started this, as you see here already in 2015, 16. So um, there were um, also one problem which is hard to monitor, which I'll get to an example in the next slide, is like merged and consolidated data sets. But last but not least, as I said, our crawler is not perfect. We we um, we totally take this um, uh, on us. But on the other hand, I could also say therein lies the problem. Yeah. So um, if we look at open data parts, what I ask myself is why do we have to do this exercise? Why is the metadata not made available historically in first place? Uh, if we want to see how data develops, and I can only take the snapshot of the current metadata and don't see how it developed over time for portal. Uh, I think this is um, set for us. Yeah? So also, how should we measure the increase or the growth of open data if we just quantify we want to do this? Should we assess the number of data sets? Should we assess the number of resources? We know that actually um, each data set is actually a, a assigned usually a number of resources. Um, is that a good measure? Because you can split up your data sets into um, how many batches you want. Um, is it the sizes of the data sets? That we should take so the, the number of data, but then how can do compression formats come into account? So it's actually quite hard to get a complete picture on, uh, on to how um, you can actually assess this group of open data. So in fact, advertised sizes differ from downloadable files. So we find that in the metadata, you find different file sizes than you actually find when you download the data. 
um, etc. And also we have the problem of um, data sets that are um, always publishing current snapshots as opposed to data sets that um, incrementally grow and always add new records or new data to data sources. So who can help? Um, I don't know. Uh, we, we saw um, uh, Natasha's talk here in one of the earlier talks in the series uh, about Google's data set search. Um, I think they, they have a different scope. Um, they, they don't like, uh, they, they basically index and crawl the metadata for the search engine yet and do not um, basically index and, and assess this quality or the, the growth um, in that much detail yet. I, I've just looked yesterday and see it, it seems they rolled out some new features as well. We'll see what comes there, but it can't be up to academia to, to do this exercise, unfortunately. So we, we, we can't also bear this. Um, in our sense. Uh, still, some interesting findings of some more issues that we could observe. Um, for instance, once uh, we actually found out by our non crawl that actually some data sets of data GBIT were missing on the European data portal, um, I routed this to our colleague from uh, data GBIT who filed that an issue based on our crawls uh, on the European data portal. What happened there? And a couple of days later, it was actually online again um, and we saw the data sets reappearing which seemed to be just a, a maintenance problem so this can happen um, but which also shows that this monitoring is important it's in the interest of the portals to do these monitoring regular monitoring um, themselves and see if there's just a sudden drop of data sets and maybe something might have been wrong um, other examples of drops of data sets um, some could be political so basically um, we maybe uh, we could observe the the downtaking of all the data sets of, of the open white house gov data set with the with the now soon past um, US administration, which was really just um, just really right after the inauguration, um, which was quite interesting to observe and also made some social media echo. Um, we could observe some drop of data sets on data data gov UK. Um, when just the UK um, Article 50 was filed, actually that's the wrong signal that was um, just before, because um, a week before uh, there was a relaunch of the organization of DataGov UK, so actually no data was actually taken offline, just the resources had been consolidated. So you have to also take these developments with a grain of salt if you see these graphs. Um, anyway, um, I think we, we learned some, some interesting lessons. Um, so what we what we one of the lessons we took was that actually the metadata quality and quality of service of the portal needs to be monitored at the portals. Um, that's at least what we think because it can't be um, like just offline. From of course we can provide these monitoring services, but um, maybe we are not the right ones as a university and academia. Um, for us, what's interesting is um, rather the last point here that we could accumulate a large corpus of open data and uh, metadata um, to learn from and to do further research. But um, a real sustainability strategy uh, for something like a web archive for open, uh, open data would be actually needed in our opinion or and would be some interesting thing to, to talk about how we could establish that. Um, last but not least, uh, we did um, learn about, so we actually did metadata integration about the metadata standards from Sika and um, DCAT and, and schema.org and, and what other portals like Socrata provided and aligned them. Um, and this is needed and actually um, it's, it's, it's what we did was actually predating or feeding into Google's data set search. And I can show you some, some things that uh, we achieved there, for instance, in the first um, uh, item you, you saw there in terms of metadata quality and portal quality of, of services. So we, we actually uh, got uh, this quality check to be implemented in the Austrian Open Data Portal, which uh, used them. So at the moment, unfortunately, it's uh, in fact also due to some complications uh, that have to do with the COVID crisis and change priorities at the moment uh, because maintenance couldn't be addressed. It's at the moment not available, but we have in the Austrian Open Data Portal this adequate um, check button, which, we, uh, which was actually doing this quality me measurement um, regularly on the open data sets um, on the open data portal. This is a useful monitoring tool. Um, 
for as for feeding into uh, Google's dataset search. That's also interesting. So you still still see uh, now if you if you go to um, dataset search, several datasets being marked as datasets from from Portal Watch. So you see here Data Viewer CRT as the as the provider of here a data set that it's actually actually from the Spanish open government data portal um, or it's an old it's a historic instance of the data set that you still find there but um, uh, that has maybe gone um, and that we managed to archive at least a little bit um, and so in in the beginning of the launch of of, of Google's data set search actually a lot of portals were only reachable or uh, displayed in data set search through our metadata search because they did not yet um, put the right um, schema.org metadata on their data portal which we provided all our, out of the box through our uh, metadata integration method. So that was a nice achievement for academics to see your own work appear um, on on those um, uh, on on this search portal by Google. Um, but what we're more interested in is on the analyzability or the analysis of, of this corpus. So we 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 actually also collected um, huge corpora of, uh, for instance, tabular data, which we also could find out, of course, in our analysis, is the by far most prevalent format, not by far actually even so, but at least in terms of structured formats, you see here CSV as the top format, um, and then come um, PDF, HTML, and, and then only um, JSON comes with a much lower number of percentage and so on. So um, you see that um, the declared formats, and um, we could analyze also the licenses, also, if you look at the top 10 licenses appearing, what you see already in this analysis that, that's auto generated from the metadata, that um, you have alignment problems. There is actually not a unique um, naming between the licenses being used. So if you look here at the top 10 licenses, you see the, for instance, Creative Commons Attribution License being named in various forms and also in various languages. Um, but the reason is that there is actually not unique identifiers being used, which is one of the advantages of using RDF and big data, that you have unique identifiers for unique metadata values. So this is unfortunately um, not followed as, uh, as, uh, as well in, in the metadata of, uh, that we crawl from open data portals, where the metadata um, values are uh, usually just um, strings. So we, we had some work on, on aligning this license metadata, um, but I think this is clearly needed and I'll get a later example where this becomes even more obvious that you, uh, you would need to make more use of open data um, this alignment in terms of common identifiers of also the metadata values and not only the metadata schema in terms of its keys. Um, so I, I don't want to go into the details of this analysis, but you find some interesting insights about what characteristics of open data CSVs we found actually um, and how partially non-compliant with the standards. So they're actually hard to handle partially. They have like multiple CSVs in once occurs very, very often. And um, we, we also use this data set later on for, for other analysis. So what's next? Yeah, so this we basically have done um, this, this monitoring of open data portals. What could we do more? Um, um, one thing, if you really want to make um, a, a fair data ecosystem from this open data, what could we do in terms of uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse? So. Um, the first thing is to ask ourselves, is data search really addressed well enough? Is Google data set was it, what it offers to us? Is it, is it offering enough? Couldn't we do much more? Um, is data archiving and uniform access? So is accessibility actually possible? And also what I want to talk later on, which is grayed out because I think it's actually beyond current open data portals, uh, what we can do with what the functionality we have currently there is, um, how could we enable also non-open data? How could we democratize um, not only the access to data, but also the data processing? And in the end, I want to give a quick, um, hopefully if I have time, architectural vision of what we do that. Um, so actually for findability, I think it should also extend to um, non-open data. And I'll get there um, once I've talked about what we've done to findability and search um, uh, that far. So. Um, for enabling search and findability, knowledge graphs can actually help. Um, and I want to give you some three examples of searches for data sets that you could, uh, could think of where um, this could, could help actually. So one of the things is 
um, looking for spatial temporal entities. Like for instance, if I look for Leopoldstadt, which is the district here around uh, my university, I want to find data that relates to the area around here. I could search that on open data uh, on a data set search and I want to get results. Um, for the se se a similar question could be uh, searching for certain organizations in, in data set search, right? I want, for instance, data sets published by the Federal Ministry of Digital Realization and Economic Affairs here in Austria, that is actually the provider of the open data portal. Um, so they run the open data portal. Um, and I could find um, semantically comparable data sets. Sorry for the typo there. So this needs kind of some semantic labeling of data sets. If you want to find data sets combinable with other data sets. So let's look at the first question. How could we enable this spatial temporal search? Um, spatial temporal search is actually not working in current open data portals. So it works neither on the data portals themselves. You don't find really the right data sets there. Um, nor does it work on Google dataset search where you get some, um, yeah, some kind of related datasets, but they, they are really not what you expect. So I would expect here all the datasets, for instance, published by the city of Vienna that would give you um, district data because that's a district of the city of Vienna and Leopoldstadt is one of them. So I would uh, expect to get all this district data um, from the datasets. However, this doesn't work because the current metadata search, uh, the current search is only metadata search. So it doesn't look into the data sets. And we, we actually wrote some paper and made some prototype out of showing that the solution could be um, twofold. So first of all, you look, need to look into the data, not only the metadata, kind of clear. And second, what helps is link into existing knowledge graphs. So for a prototype for geographic search, what we used is was a geographic knowledge graph that we gathered from openly available knowledge graphs like OpenStreetMap, GeoNames, and, and Wikidata, which we arranged into one knowledge graphs about um, districts, street names, and um, areas, and regions, and countries. And uh, so basically, we had a hierarchy of, of geographic entities in this knowledge graph. And this we can then use for data set labeling. So we go through the data set uh, one by one, we go, for instance, through columns. And if we find here, for instance, you see here, city names in Austria. Yeah? It's like you see, I hope you can read it. You see Linz, Steyr, Wels, Altheim, Asbach. And if you look into our knowledge graph, you see that these all have common root, which is um, cities in Upper Austria. Yeah? This helps us also to disambiguate the labeling because there's a Linz also, for instance, in Germany. But since it doesn't appear in the context of other German cities, but only Austrian cities, we know that we can consolidate these to the values of Linz. So it helps to use the knowledge graph to do these annotations. And then we can provide um, a much better search, which um, can search for, we also use um, search for temporal entities, by the way. So we can search for data sets based on the locations mentioned in the data set and the temporal range that um, is mentioned, in the data set, which is an extremely useful feature because it is what many people are looking for when they look for. So we could consider this first question is done. Um, the second question is about this. Um, and the third question are kind of still too hard a bit. So and let me explain um, to you why. So for instance, um, the search for organizations, why is it hard? Actually, these ministries, they, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the governmental entities, they, they change. They change with every legislation, with every new administration. They're rearranged, they're merged, um, they're renamed. Um, so, uh, and that's kind of hard to track. So we, we try to identify at least the main challenges that need to be tackled to overcome this paper, uh, these problems in, in, a, in a paper this year. Um, and the five main challenges we see to, to make this organizational search um, possible, which would be extremely ent interesting for us because we want to answer questions like who published more data, who published which data um, based on the organization, are A, the temporal changes in the organizations that I mentioned, the lack of the base ontology for describing organizational structures and changes, um, and uh, again, metadata quality, multilinguality, disambiguation of public sector organizations. For instance, on several portals, it's just called statistics office, and it, uh, what is called what is actually the statistics office of the respective country, and you would need to align that. So there are no unique identifiers. So we could try to match that to knowledge graphs, which have these unique identifiers, but also these knowledge graphs are incomplete with respect to um, monitoring these changes and having the, the changes and the history of the organizations being, um, being reflected in those knowledge graphs. 
Yeah. So what we could do in the paper, we could not present the solution, but, but we could actually um, give an analysis, which I don't want to go into details about how severe this problem is, when, how often these changes um, occur, etc. And I don't want to um, go into detail there in the interest of time and also to leave time for questions. Um, so the, the next thing, which is also too hard, is actually to find these um, um, combinable, combinable data sets. Because again, we have a lack of coverage in current knowledge graphs. So there is, there is things being talked about in open data that is not being talked about in these current knowledge graphs. For instance, you don't find like um, counts of, of invalid votes or something like that, or length of transport networks as attributes in uh, the current existing knowledge graphs. So we need kind of um, either, if you want to bring this together, we need maybe um, to uh, just uh, agree on, on, a, on a subset of, of the data we want to, uh, uh, and entities and columns we can link. Um, or we also need to improve the representation of, uh, of data, of public data in knowledge groups. And there's some problems there. For instance, um, in Wikidata, the election class, so if you want to model election results, has 70, 87 subclasses in total, which was we just found in the bachelor thesis. And they often represent parties and the results completely differently. So the, the, the freedom that Wikidata allows for modeling this knowledge, its own knowledge graph also has led to heterogeneity within this knowledge. So um, there is still some work to do um, to make, to improve it. Um, so to have a uniform and best practice of representation of, for instance, election results such that we make them comparable across. Um, um, data that is being published. Um, the other issue is basically highlighted there. So in our own research community, we have great challenges on matching tabular data to knowledge graphs. But if you look into the test data there, it's not actually the test data from open data portals, but it is actually um, tabular data that is made for human consumption that uses entities that appear in these knowledge graphs. And I think um, the problem that uh, we have the relevant data not being represented in the knowledge graphs is not, not yet tackled. Okay, so um, what could we do for getting data archiving and uniform access um, going? So we, we have developed here um, very recently a, a solution to extend our metadata monitoring and search to also crawl the actual data sets. So we try to now crawl also all the structured data have set that up in the distributed um, basically Kubernetes cluster to, to scale it and to also um, collect a, a corpus of, of, of the, the data that is actually accumulating on, um, on these open data portals that we monitor. And you see here, we have collected something like uh, terabytes of data that you can actually now go there and you have unique uniform access to this. So we have the, the uniform metadata, you can query over the uniform metadata and say, I want all data sets um, from 2019 to 2020, um, from this or that um, sets of data, uh, data portals and so on. And you can even download those as a zip file. So that was a very nice work done actually by a bachelor student in our group, mainly uh, Thomas Weber, uh, and was presented in the ISWC conference. But it's also a starting point only, and it's really a question, should we really be doing this? Um, should uh, or um, should the web archive or the Googles or who, who should actually do this archiving. I think it's extremely valuable and allows us to, um, to basically better assess and be more transparent actually what's happening on open data if we had these archived versions as well. So last but not least, let's go to the questions we didn't answer yet. Um, how could we enable also non-open data? Um, and all the other errors that I have not um, talked about and how could we actually tackle those points that are beyond what current open data platforms offer or what I think they don't offer yet. So first of all, um, what about all the non-open data? Yeah? Um, the problem is uh, that at the moment we have metadata and also data only for completely open data. But there's a lot of data that public data that is not shared and it can't be made open because it's, for instance, microcensus data that contains um, uh, de -anon -anon anonymizable information, but would be very relevant for research like registry data, even COVID vaccine data nowadays is something that is usually discussed, where is it? Um, and we want this as open data, but we can't, uh, uh, under all circumstances, publish all sensitive data. At least we want to have who has that data, where it is, and could it be made accessible for research? Yeah. 
So we could think about um, extending what we think about now in an open data ecosystem, not to only what is completely open, but also to have at least the metadata description, who owns which data, what is the metadata, um, and how could I get in touch with this entity, under which conditions and policies does, does the entity provide the data? Is it available or open to, to research? Um, do uh, laws allow actually research to access that data? All this information should also be um, transparently uh, available. Accountability records of this data should be available, um, etc. So we could also think this further of um, building a system that enables automated access to the data um, by using EIDs um, and automatically basically signing contracts that you can actually that you verify that you're, for instance, a researcher by things like standards like W3's verifiable credentials or formal policies in standards like ODRL. So this could be machine described as well, and the system could maybe um, help to make automated access more easier and um, more efficient. Um, we've also written about such points in a, in a, in a recent um, um, postulate that we actually sent to our government, uh, also published here um, by the Austrian Association for Artificial Intelligence, because we think that the availability of this data to research and basically better linking research um, with data um, could be something that happens over these data ecosystems. Yeah, it's not it's not a given that only big companies can do um, the, uh, do research on open uh, on on big data, but also the university partners the the access to this data. Is, is usually not given, but could be enabled by the metadata at least being available and seeing and making transparent who owns which data and what could be done eventually. So um, the next point, sorry for the animations that work a bit wrongly there. Um, I, what I also would like to, to, to talk about is um, the democratization of data processing. Um, I think there we also miss some opportunity because I, what, what should maybe be done is that um, open data um, portals and um, cloud platforms should be available in, in one holistic ecosystem. So like um, all the serverless AI platforms now demonstrate to us who have, um, who have big data sets alongside with machine learning um, interfaces that are very easy to use. and. Uh, but that's basically just um, offered by companies at the moment. Could we build such uh, such a, an ecosystem in the open? And the answer for that, um, I think, would be uh, something that I would show you in this last slide, which is uh, an idea, at least for an architecture, that should enable such a, the, such an ecosystem in a decentralized way. Yeah. So um, what we think of what a what an architecture for such a decentralized ecosystem could look for is. Um, data hubs that are connected um, uh, and that serve data catalogs, but data catalogs and, and also knowledge graphs that, that describe the information found there are only um, some part of it. Yeah? So what such a, um, a decentralized hub should, uh, you could imagine that a data set provider on such a hub, but also the data portals which harvest the data metadata from them, but also the portals alongside um, are networked with each other and have their own user um, usage policies for their users. Of course, you need to also register users there. So we, we basically have at the moment this problem on open data portals that you don't know who is using that, them because we have no access policies to them. But that could solve maybe the problem of also engaging open and closed data. And I know that in, in several industry sectors like industrial data spaces and so on, there is um, solutions now being conceived for data ecosystems. Um, but usually they think um, open data not as really uh, a part of it or, or maybe not, not enough. I think basically, basically these two things should not be uh, thought of separately, but together. So um, the, the data ecosystems are really just the next step and not a separate thing. Um, thanks to some collaborators, which we work on that. So that's actually from some, I should say, even a proposal where um, to build such a, a data ecosystem, which we currently um, are working on with several of these partners. So um, I hope I managed time-wise some, somehow. Um, the take-home summary of this talk is knowledge graphs and linked data can help us to strengthen um, open data. And they're both just two puzzle pieces for what I think is an open data ecosystem or what I would rather call the web of data. 
Yeah. So what I think we should really um, further do and what we will need is including close data in our considerations, mixed top, top down uh, approaches to establish best practices and standards of publishing um, uh, and sharing um, uh, data uh, with bottom up population of, of this web of data. And we will need a working decentralized architecture for this, supporting this quality of data and quality of service monitoring out of the box, access control, et cetera. From an academic viewpoint, of course, we, there's still enough to do um, to serve a couple of PhDs. If you want to help or if you feel that uh, that could be interesting for you, we're actually hiring. So you find more information on my uh, Twitter handle there or also on our webpage, um, which is also listed here in the end. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much, Axel. This has been... Um a very rich insight into current um, academic work, current research um, going on in your team and, and with collaborators, which also has an impact into to how open data, open government data is, is, is published. And, and you've also given us all some food for thought about for, for, for new topics, new areas that we should be um, perhaps considering. I am going to quickly summarize the questions in the chat and I'm going to start with um, um, a question from Mauro. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Has any study been conducted um, or do you have any insight on open data reusers? Are they considered part of the ecosystem? Do you like to comment on that? In, in a way, this is also part of, uh, of the problem of the, the current architecture of open data portals. So hardly any of the portals um, have a feedback mechanism that would be in any sense obligatory. Um, we have in the Austrian open data portal, there is basically the, the, the possibility to register apps, which is basically where the Austrian open data portal sees that actually this app is using in the data set and you can advertise that. And that's also part, uh, so apps are also, um, listed there and can be, can be entered there, which is a good first step. But as soon as you, as, as long as you don't have any, um, like, um, basically a system that, that essentially allows you to track the usage, there's no real way to monitor it. Thank you. Someone writing with a very loud keyboard. So if you can put yourself thank on the you. Note. Thank you. No, it's not you, Axel. Don't worry about it. Um, and Mauro, on that note, the European Data Portal itself has um, published a number of reports that looked at, at data users and data use. Um, mm -hmm. The more recent, most recent one is about is an analysis of. Um, um, of search logs where we're trying to understand users um, from from the data, from the digital traces that they leave as yeah. they um, engage with the portal. Um, so if you want to have a look at that, there's also lots of references in that report to yeah. um, studies, um, mm -hmm. uh, both from Axel's team and, and, and beyond um, that look at at, at, at users, um, but obviously um, I agree with Axel that the, the means we have to learn about these users are quite quite limited. I'm going to move on to Magnus. Uh, so Magnus has commented on the importance of quality, so quality um, of data, quality of, of, of metadata, um, and, and, and he states uh, it is extremely important in actual use um, because beyond research, implementation relies on quality. And um, how could this be tackled? So um, perhaps you could share with us your your thoughts about it. So, so we we know some of us painfully from our own experience how bad things are. Um, what would be your ideas to 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 try to fix this? Yeah. So I mean, to some extent, I I, I think I, I already mentioned it. I think that the um, there is not enough. Uh, there, there needs to be some some kind of quality of service agreement, uh, basically uh, guarantees in in the data that is published, which is at the moment not really the case. It's, and it's also um, like good monitoring would help there, right? So basically, if you see that things go down and then 
the providers are alerted um, is it, it would be one first step. The reason why this maybe partially hasn't happened so far was because we, we tried to engage uh, more entities and, and parties to, to to, to, to put any data up there and, and open their data, which is hard enough and has, has its own challenges. But um, then, of course, you need to, at some point, also um, add the annoying notch that actually you also need to keep it sustainable. So it's not enough to, to keep the data up for some time and then basically just view it on the side. Um, one thing that we also have to say um, here, sadly, is that um, priorities are maybe at the moment a bit against us. Yeah? So in, in a way that uh, what we see ourselves is that uh, we, we we struggle with some maintenance questions now um, that, for instance, may, uh, uh, con consider this quality button that we can't tackle because at the moment really many governments and, uh, are understandably busy with other things. So we hope that things improve um, more um, as we manage also this crisis and, and, and see how important um, this will also be transparency and open data will also be in getting um, through the aftermath of all this, um, but we we can only hope. Yeah, so I, I think it's important to to really take um, quality of service and quality of data um, serious, monitor it from the portal side, and avoid such issues that data is not available for some time. It's only recognized by the users. The openness is actually also a good thing. Um, open data has often also helped to improve the quality of data. I always um, uh, remember these very nice examples, for instance, from the Austrian Open Data Portal or from the city of Vienna, who published data sets with bad quality, that they have a tree that is actually um, a few uh, hundred meters wide, which is just, of course, data entering errors. But through publishing it as open data, this was actually recognized by the users and could be fixed. So openness and open data has also, it's good for improving the quality of data. So we have to see this uh, both effects. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to apologize to Michalis. Uh, it was a question from Michalis following a comment from Magnus. And thank you, Magnus, as well, for, for the pointer to um, the, the, the use case. Perhaps a final question from me to, to conclude. So um, the... Um, um, open data portal watch is a is 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 an amazing work, um, and I do agree with you that that monitoring this is 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 absolutely crucial um, because often publishers are not aware of all the different aspects. I was wondering whether there has been any attempt to put the results or the insights you've gained from the open data portal watch data uh, in context with other um studies um mm, yeah. particularly yeah. macro studies of uh, the open data ecosystem i'm thinking not just about the maturity report but also the various types of rankings barometers indices that are ultimately linked to a national portal um okay, so yeah, I, I can just say at this moment ongoing uh, work for uh, thesis <laughs> that actually i have um, some some people looking into this it would be extremely interesting to um we we have to also say that um admittedly uh, um some of the pre preparation of our metadata which we actually found out then during the start of this work uh, that we still had to reassess and and, and basically provide it a bit cleaner um, but we, that's exactly something we want to look into. We want to compare this um, data and the growths um, with um, the likes of the maturity report and, and the barometer and so on. Unfortunately, some of these efforts that were also tied to projects uh, had the same fate of just basically being not continued, um, which is, is a pity. So we, we, we um, suffer sometimes from that some studies are only available for a certain time frame, which is not necessarily compatible with ours. So that's also why, why basically sustaining this kind of research is so important. And we, we also struggle, but we try to basically, we had several relaunches of this portal watch um, things um, to, to basically get more complete over time. And we want to run this on and enable such research. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just to um, wrap up, the presentation and the slides are going to be uh, made available. Uh, Raul, um, yeah, I see the answer has, has already been added to the chat. Everything is available, previous recordings um, of all this. 
thank you, Axel, for being with us um, uh, today uh, and for these um, very interesting thoughts and, 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 and insights. And uh, for everyone else, I hope you will join me in two weeks um, when we are going to welcome Lucy Knight um, to a next edition of uh, our webinar se series on the future of open data portal series. Uh, until then, stay safe and uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.